The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you, as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increases of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Isaiah 9, 2 through 4, 6 through 7. Stand and join us. See between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your way into the light. Then through the darkness, your loving God. Tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross, the cross has spoken. I am forgiven. The King of kings called. I'm yours forever, in Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah.
For this Advent season, we lament the brokenness of our world. We are surrounded by tumultuous news. We are drowning in negativity. We are lost in our search for solutions. Even our churches are filled with division. We are in danger of becoming apathetic, numb to the cries of those around us. Our hearts are made of stone. Lord, be not far away from us. Come to our aid. Heal us with your love. We long for the promised days of your coming. We read the scriptures and they become our prayer. We see your promises and cling to them in our struggle. We clothe ourselves in your mercy. We pray, come, Emmanuel. Luke 1, 26 through 38. Thank you. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. 
Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How can this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Mary's response was quick. After asking her one clarifying logistical question, how can this be, she jumped in with both feet. No hemming or hawing, no conditions, no asking for anything for herself. I am the Lord's servant. Let it be to me according to your word. Then in verses 39 through 56, she goes to her cousin Elizabeth, of whom the angel had spoken. And after just a greeting, just a greeting, Elizabeth knew in her spirit what God was doing in Mary. She was filled with the Holy Spirit, who encouraged and praised Mary through Elizabeth, confirming God's favor on her. Elizabeth, prayed, uh, Elizabeth praised Mary for her faith, saying, Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. If we're serious about following Jesus, how can we not live with Mary's humble faith that he will be good and he will be glorified? Mary's response is to praise the Lord, singing of the promises she has faith in. He who is mighty will do great things. He will exalt the lonely. He will fill the hungry with good things. He will remember his people just to name a few of the things that she praised God for. The social ramifications of being an unmarried, pregnant Jewish woman must have been great, but yet her eyes are fully trained on the Lord and on this miracle he chose her to be a part of. Do you sense her excitement? She's waiting for the answer to all of these prophecies, and not only a few months will she not just get to meet him, she'll get to hold him in her arms. In Luke 2, 4 through 7, we see this waiting come to an end. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available. We don't have too many details of this night, but what we do have are important. She brought forth this miracle, this answer to hundreds of years of prayers. Hundreds of years of prayers. She brought forth this miracle and carefully and lovingly swaddled this beloved and much anticipated son, gently placing him in the only bed available, a manger. Can you picture the care and tenderness of motherhood on her face and the awe and gratitude in her heart? Can you sense the excitement? The promised king was finally here. What a picture of the humble kingship Jesus would live throughout his life, starting with his humble mother Mary in a lonely manger. What a gift this must have been to her, a servant of the Lord.
same region where there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. But the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, from the realms of glory wing your flight o'er all the earth ye who sang creation story now proclaim messiah's birth come and worship come and worship worship christ the newborn king Jesus. 
seat. As we continue worshiping this morning, we're going to get a chance now to partake in uh, this meal that Jesus himself instituted as a gift for us, as a gift for his people. And really, in this meal, everything that we're celebrating, everything that we're reflecting more deeply upon in this season, everything that we're trying to live more fully into as we celebrate Advent, it's all encompassed in this meal. The already and the not yet the promise that was fulfilled and the promise that is still to come and the tension of the in-between. Because this is a meal of celebration, right? It's a meal of remembrance as we look back and remember that God became a man, that he took on flesh, was born, lived, died, and rose again for the sake of his people, for the sake of this world and all of creation. And this is what we're celebrating in this season But there's also another side to Advent. There's another side to this meal because it is also a meal of hope. It's a meal of longing and anticipation as we look forward to the day when he will return. The promise that he's made that he will come here and reign on earth as he does now in heaven. The day when he will come and redeem and restore all of creation, mending everything that is broken. And so as we take this meal, we are reminded that even when everything around us and everything in us at times feels so dark, light is coming. This meal helps us hold on to that hope. And so as we come, we're going to come up next to the manger here. Um, Let us celebrate. Let us rejoice. Emmanuel has come. But let this meal also stir in us a sense of longing. Let it cause us to say, come Lord Jesus. Let it help us cling to the hope that he is coming again. So there's going to be two lines up here, um, and you can come and dip the bread in the cup. If you're gluten-free, just let the people know who are serving, uh, and they can, they can give you a gluten-free piece of bread. Um, so take a few, a few seconds and reflect, live into this, and then when you're ready, come up and eat. silent night a child to God is born in all that is brought again that air was lost or lorn but could thy soul O man become a silent night God would be born in thee and set all things aright the light of the world has come and he shined into our lives so that through him we might give light to all the world 
So with that, would you grab your candle and turn her on? All right, we're going to sing O Come one more time. O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. And come and behold him, born the King of angels. O come, let us adore. Good morning, church. Keep those lights shining. <laughs> um, every season, I keep coming back to this question. What is the fuss about this baby? Strange question. I mean, I know what the fuss is about my baby, but... Uh, and I'm thankful to hear babies in here. Uh, it's, it's awesome to hear that sound. But what is the fuss about this baby? Every season I come back to this question, and I think it's a good one to come back to. We have beheld holy sights, held our breath in wonder, but what's the fuss? News from an angel, an army of angels, the royal announcements. What is the fuss over this baby? Why do we... Stress ourselves out every year over this baby, right? This infant cannot speak. The word is wordless. He is literally helpless. What is the fuss? We want a fighter. We want a soldier. A baby? But yet, behold, good tidings of great joy, this infant and God's slow way will grow, will cry. Those cries will shift. He will begin to speak words. The word will form sentences, sing songs, tell jokes, take steps, laugh, encounter sadness, loneliness, conflict, the slow way of the Lord, the way a flower grows from a seed, the way the mountains are shaped in an epoch, the way river carves through rock, the word becomes flesh. The king is here. The king of promises is here. The king of expectation. That is who the shepherds encountered when they left their flock, when they ran through the streets in the middle of the night, hurrying, whispering, laughing to each other until they found a baby in a feeding trough. And hushed, they knelt. Parents in stunned joy and exhausted awe of miracle. And the shepherds speak of their own miracle, the angels. The dark royal violet sky was torn open, the fields erupting with divine rejoicing, extravagance. The world might think this extravagance wasted on peasants, on a subclass of people in a rural district of the glorious empire. Why not angels over Rome or even Jerusalem? Why not this glorious retinue for the emperor or the senate? But this isn't for them. This is not for them. This is for the powerless. This crying infant is a sign that everything will be flipped upside down. Again, the parents are in awe and the shepherds Go back to their job. They have always been shepherds. They always will be shepherds. But now they have encountered God, the Messiah. The grass looks a little greener. The stars look a little brighter. The dirt in their fingernails are a little dirtier. The baby is older now, a toddler. He knows a few words. He doesn't stop moving. He's, he's running. He's climbing. He's playing. And instead of angels, it's time. It's a star. 
And these men have been looking for the star their whole lives. They have practiced, taught in an ancient religion, trained to look for the supernatural. They remember one of their own who had been a captive, even had come from this, this land. But he was a wise man, and they remember his words, his visions, and so they journey searching, and they stop at the royal palace. But the one they are looking for is not there. So they go to a town of shepherds, of poverty. Their resplendent robes covered in the dust of a thousand miles. Their strange faces weathered by 600 days of the sun. It is a strange collision when these men, these magi, meet the little boy and bow and offer gifts and worship. And they too have encountered the supernatural the relentless searching has led them here to this toddler, to this ruddy boy covered in the dirt of his yard, running around his mother's knee. Again, a sign of the upending of things, and now their robes aren't so resplendent. Their crowns are not so shiny. They have encountered the king. This fuss for this baby, this majesty for this little one of promise and a person of expectation made whole. And in both encounters, the shepherds remain shepherds. The magi remain magi, but they go away. To do what? What next? What does the day-to-day look like now? In Luke's account, the shepherds leave worshiping. In Matthew's account of the magi, they worship and they walk away worshiping. Not anymore in the physical presence of the word, but they still worship. This encounter has left them sure of something. And this encounter is available to us. What will we do? Who will we be? To mark the certainty of the shepherds and the magi might be easy to imagine, right? But the word did not heal. The word did not perform a miracle. The word was, is the miracle, and they believed. They believed. The word in this form had not yet raised anyone from the dead, had not yet fed the 5,000, had not yet been crucified, had not yet walked out of the grave. He was not yet the death killer, but they believed. And we are surrounded by that word belief this time of year. My daughter's bombarded by it. This culture that says, we still believe. But that belief is in something fleeting, something forced, something made up. And yet we have these two groups, shepherds and magi, poor and rich, powerless, powerful, settled and searching, uneducated and educated. They encountered the same thing and they left, doing the same thing, believing, worshiping, We are called, we are all called, we are all invited. The Father, the Shepherd, He knows where we are, who we are, and He calls us. And brothers and sisters, we may not have angel armies ripping apart the skies before us on December 24th. We we might not have ancient, mystic, deep knowledge based on centuries of experience and learning, but we can encounter the Word every day. Day And we are given a choice every day to do nothing or to keep walking and believing. Folks, every day I have to choose belief. I choose hope because I encounter the world and maybe because I have encountered the word. Maybe my faith is lacking because I'm not encountering the wordless word in the manger. Because sometimes I feel like I need a little more. In my depravity, I sometimes love God for what he does for me, not just because of who he is but I still choose belief. Our response to all this fuss should be as the shepherds, should be as the magi, should be as Mary, should be as Zechariah and Simeon to worship. Over and over again, the Spirit has been speaking that into my heart this year. Just keep worshiping. Just keep worshiping. Just worship. Just worship. Oh no, this has happened. Just keep worshiping. This person is going through this right now. Just keep worshiping. I'm struggling. Just keep worshiping. And that command resounds in Scripture, not for the things He has done for us, not even for the things He will do for us, simply because of who He is and who we are. The psalmist says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God and we are His people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand, the Word made flesh. So we worship. We worship. What does that worship look like? The apostle says in Romans 12, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. 
If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Whatever it is, just keep worshiping. Be shepherds. Be magi. Keep worshiping. Worship. Worship, and in our worship, in our longing, in our hope, we are formed. We are formed as God's people. We are formed as we encounter the Word every day. In my own life, I have to come back, not only to the cross, but to the manger every day and remind myself to bow in awe, to hold on to this moment, this reality of when heaven was breaking through to the earth. So I end with a call, a call to worship. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who had made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Almighty God, we come before you in awe. We come before you as a people who, who struggle to, to see through the distraction, to see you in a manger. God made flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. Our rescuer, our savior, our deliverer. God, we come before you and we worship. We worship. Father, through this season, help us to keep worshiping with your spirit. Keep worshiping. We are surrounded by bad news to keep worshiping when we can't, we think we can't hold on any longer to keep worshiping. And we worship for those around us. We worship for ourselves. We worship to give you glory, almighty God. It is only in your name that life is found. It is only in your name. And so we remember that this is what the fuss is all about, God. We encounter the word made flesh crying, swaddled in a manger. Amen.
praise you for who you are. Amen. Many hundreds of years, this is the weekly collect from the Book of Common Prayer for the first week of Advent. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now, in the time of this mortal life in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal. Through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so for our closing blessing this morning, I want you to put on that armor of light. I want you to hold your candle up. And I want you to receive this blessing this morning. May you put on the light of Christ and shine forth during this season of Advent. And may you be transformed by the hope, by the peace, by the joy, and by the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as you wait expectantly for his return again. Peace be with you. Would you go in that peace? Amen. Thanks for joining us today.